Nature's a lot smarter than we are. When you merge with something that's much bigger than you, it's part of your intuition or your instincts. Oh, neither of us really knew where we were going in our lives, except anything he ever got into, we did it 100%. He is definitely follows his passion and his heart, and. It's a really beautiful thing to see in a parent. It makes you feel free to be able to do that yourselves. When I bought the property, we didn't name an earth care farm then. I had a landscaping business and we ran the landscaping business off the farm and immediately started having a home garden and a compost in my landscaping business. Right after World War II, everybody started using chemicals like crazy. Michael got very disillusioned with that and realized that uh, he wanted to try something different. He was just out there working in the garden, and he just came in and he said, I made a decision. I don't want to use chemicals anymore. I'm going to change my name to the Organic Landscape Company. You really get involved with getting composting into your bones. You get these rare glimpses of uh, your inseparability from nature, and, and that's what a lot of this is about. It's what I call the aha moments. The first time I had it was in the garden in the 70s, uh, where I realized that the height of simplicity is that the soil is the foundation of our health and well being. It's so simple if we just take care of the little things like taking care of our soil. Uh, will be healthier and healthier. We were in it as one of the only organic lawn care businesses. We treated lawns and established lawns organically, holistically. People in the industry thought Mike was crazy. They didn't understand it at all. And of course, his professors that he used to be very friendly with and talk with and go for advice and everything, it didn't make any sense to them. The education in those days, the funding was coming from chemical companies. We really believed in the professors and that they believed in what they were doing. They weren't doing it just because of money, but the solutions weren't working out. There was a, a lot of landscapers out there and very few people just uh, making and supplying a good quality compost. So I decided just to make compost and got out of the landscaping business. At the time, Rhode Island was just beginning to think about regulations for organic farming. I'm chief of the Division of Agriculture for Rhode Island DEM. Mike's been always part of that world for me. Mike's known as a composter or as an organic farmer, but when you play that role as he did for many years, he helped us determine policies relating to wetlands, helped develop the, the organics certification program in, in the state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island was around, I think, the second state in the country that had a state-level organic certification program. He would speak at a conference back in the 80s, I guess. He'd be the only one talking about organic farming and the importance of the soil there was the Natural Organic Farming Association. I was one of the founders of that in Rhode Island and the first president of it. And it attracted a lot of like-minded people that were very concerned about the health and well-being of the planet. And more importantly, um, people. <laughs> You can draw a lot of parallels of composting and existence. The compost shows you there's no such thing as permanent death because everything gets uh, turned back into the life force.
Early on, my dad found out that the more diverse the ingredients were, the more diverse the different microorganisms from each thing would be, and the nutrients and micronutrients. We have a ratio of 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Our nitrogen sources are fish scraps and seaweed and manures and food scraps. We make this beautiful little nest of carbon. We dump in the nitrogen, cover it with more carbon because we need so much more than the nitrogen, mix it all up, get that perfect ratio, and then that's the perfect habitat we've created right then for the microorganisms to just flourish. In our system, those microorganisms are working so hard eating. As they move and digest, they get hotter and hotter, and the temperature of the pile gets hotter and hotter, and it generally gets between 140 to 160 degrees on, by that third day. That really is what we're looking for to sterilize any weed seed or plant pathogens that could have been in the original mix. In our system, it does take a little longer. We turn our pile about 12 times in a year. Then we uh, have a beautiful end product there after about a year. You know, some things take a long time to come about, and especially like as temps cool, that's when the, the higher life forms start to come in. You can't rush that. At the high school, I built a greenhouse and grew food with students as part of a history class. People think you just stick plants in the ground and they're going to be a gardener. People in the school would come out and say, wow, my plants don't look like this at home. And I'd say, well, what are you putting in the soil? See this stuff? And I'd pick up a handful of this stuff. This is real life giving soil. This is dark and rich. Knowledgeable gardeners, they'll have no qualms about getting Earth Care Farm compost. Chemical agriculture, you're thinking, oh, I need to provide the nutrients for the plants. Immediately, you're putting down this salt-based fertilizer, which has the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus you think that the plant needs, and you're usurping that whole system the composting process is taking the illnesses of our society and processing them into something really positive. So we're taking what people consider waste and letting nature turn it into something really higher and useful. So when you get a bag of Mike's compost, or in our case, tons of it dropped off by trucks, you're getting a bit of the world in the deepest sense. Back then I was very, very enthusiastic. If somebody wanted to chat about it, we'd have a good long chat and uh, become friends. I would stop working for an hour and talk with somebody about composting or the process or give them a farm tour, but then have to work until dark. Mike is a special individual. There's no one I've ever met that's like Mike. He just has an aura about him. You just know he's tapped into something that like we're not. He's sort of the center of the universe to me. He's just super generous. He's super supportive. He, he never sort of made me feel like I didn't belong. I always knew that I had the place here. I love my dad. He sees everything as a circle of life and there's a simplistic beauty in that. Everybody always wants Mike to do the blessing at a wedding or a grace or he kind of has this innate feeling of how to make things better. Whenever I see him, he always says you're perfect. He says it to a lot of people. I know they're not perfect, but they're perfect to him. And I think that's really nice of him to say because I think he means it. I feel like he looks into your soul and he looks at you and I feel like he's just magical in a way that not a lot of people have that. It's his deep, deep love of soil, of every microbe. It's personal, it's intimate, and it's spiritual. He's my best friend. He's been a terrific soulmate. He always used to say, I'm just going to work till the day I die and then just throw me in the compost. That's not the way it's going to be for him. It comes a point where it's like wearing out a pair of shoes. I feel like um, I'm wearing out. It's difficult when you can't do what you took for granted. <laughs> we didn't have a plan in place of how we would 
what the succession plan would be for the farm. 95% of New England farms are run by retirement age farmers without a plan in place. My parents went to bed that night. They really believe there's angels and asked the farm angels, what's the best solution for the farm? We need help in sorting out what's to come for the farm. What's the future of the farm? And that same night, I woke up feeling so sturdy in myself that this is what I want to do. I thought I was going to be able to do it forever and then I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm totally relieved that Jane has taken over and um, that we came up with a transition plan. Jane is doing it in a bigger way with the community than I could. Betty and I just started a little foundation for her and she's building on it. She's got some pretty good soil to build upon. Lots of farm tours with young children and farm activities with young children. It's what the farm should be used for. If you are getting a clear message, you need to follow that, even if it seems like a, a huge diversion from what you're currently doing. Our time is short and sweet, and you got to do what feels right. Trust yourself. Listen to your intuition and follow your heart. And that'd be the only advice I'd ever have for anybody. So it's not deep in my soul, it's deep in the spirit of the oneness of life.